Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, special uh, pandemic update head med chat all about COVID. Uh, my name is Dr. Nisi Hudson. I'm the chair and science director of Hood Medicine Initiative. And I'm Jonathan White. I'm the co-founder and director of policy. Doug Slaughter, the public health director. And um, Hood Medicine Initiative is a collective of scientists, physicians, hackers, and other assorted geeks focused on addressing health disparities in black and brown communities. Hood Med Chats, our signature event, is an effort to bring the expertise of healthcare professionals and others in those communities. Our goal is very simple, help us save us. Today, we are so extremely honored to welcome Dr. Peter Hotez, PhD, MD, PhD, a professor of um, pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology, and the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, where he is also the co-director at the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. Thank you for joining us today. We're so honored to have you. Oh, the honor's all mine. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so as you know, we uh, a lot of our early work here has been focused around getting people information and um, making sure that we can mobilize, you know, underserved populations to get vaccinated. And so a lot of what we try to do around um, education is to try to break things down and in ways that people can understand. And so what we like to do is kind of give a brief um, overview of the virus and kind of help people understand how it works. And I thought maybe that we could go through it. <laughs> um, since you are clearly the expert here tonight <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so essentially. Well, there, there are not a lot of experts because not a lot of us have been working on coronaviruses. True, so I, true. You know, we've, we've been working on coronaviruses for the last decade. So I guess that makes me a bit of an expert. <laughs> <laughs> true. Um, so essentially, the way that we like to explain it is very simply, you know, it's a, it's got a protein bubble with some viral RNA, RNA inside and outside its viral ID card or the spike protein, um, which is how it gets into your cells through the ACE2 yeah, and that um, spike, receptor. And that spike protein is extremely important because the spike protein is the part of the virus that docks with the host receptor that allows it to get into our tissues in order to replicate. And, um, and when we talk about vaccines, we'll talk about the spike protein again, because all of the vaccines work by inducing an immune response to that spike protein that you're showing there. So it blocks the ability of the spike protein to attach to our tissues and therefore blocks virus replication. And as you say, like where, you know, that's how it kind of sneaks into our cells, but, and, you know, we like to always uh, compare it to keys and locks, you know, and those locks are everywhere, you know, they're in a lot of our organs. Right. Um, and so which, one of the, one of the mysteries is, you know, if remember that first SARS virus um, mm -hmm. that came out in 2003, uh, arose out of Southern China, affected Toronto, that also binds to the ACE2, but it only mostly caused really severe lung disease. Mm. So kind of the mystery is now we know the ACE2 is everywhere. It's in, it's in the, uh, as you're pointing out, it's in the, the, the nervous system. It's in our fat tissue. It's in the heart. And sure enough, the, the disease manifestations from COVID-19 are far more diverse than anything we ever saw with that first SARS. And mm. we all got fooled because we all thought that the SARS-2, which causes COVID-19, would go by the same playbook that the first SARS went by, would cause respiratory illness. But in fact, we saw people getting heart attacks. Uh, it causes a lot of blood clots to form. Uh, and it has that link with higher body mass and probably due to more adipose tissue. So, uh, we're only now fully understanding all of the consequences of COVID-19 and, and the realization it's a bad actor. It's causing um, sudden death from uh, blood clots to form uh, in, the, in the blood vessels going to the brain, causing stroke. It's causing coronary artery thrombosis, leading to heart attacks. 
uh, and it's causing uh, pulmonary emboli, blood clots going to the lungs. So that's when I really started getting scared about COVID-19, when I started hearing about the sudden deaths at home and people with really low oxygen coming into the emergency room. I said, this is something different going on here. And it, it's a pretty terrifying virus. Mm -hmm. I wish everyone knew that. Um, so basically the way, also the way that we kind of describe it to people so that they understand what the stakes really are is that once, once it gets in via that ACE2 receptor, it steals your copy machine essentially and starts making its own copies, right? Now you're sort of like a, a host factory essentially, and it wants to make viral particles for you to sneeze out on everybody in the Applebee's that doesn't have a mask on. <laughs> essentially. So, um, so I thought that we might um, talk about the way, a By the way, another piece to that, which is very interesting, is that if you remember with SARS, right, uh, that first SARS back in 2000, if you were, if you got it, you were sick, you were, you couldn't breathe well, you were going to the hospital, you weren't walking around Applebee's, right? You weren't going to bars, you weren't going to restaurants, you weren't going to the clubs. This virus does something different. About half the time, it causes no symptoms at all. And what it does is it replicates in large amounts in the mucosa of your nose and mouth. So you're shedding a lot of virus just by speaking. And that's what makes this virus so diabolical. You got this, I call it Janus face of the virus, two-faced, it's a two-faced virus. Yeah, on the one hand, you got people, you know, going around bars and restaurants, clubs, seeming fine, shedding a lot of virus in their nose and mouth. And then the other hand, you have a subset of people that we'll talk about who, uh, when they get it, they're going into the hospital or an intensive care unit. And mm -hmm. this is, that simple fact has made this, that's what's made this virus so daunting to control is, is that two-faced aspect of the virus. Yeah, we like to say that the virus, the virus figured out how to lay low, you know, and and give us in a some, chance. In some, in some, yeah, and in some, another, and, another, and unfortunately, it's it's the African American population that more likely has fallen to that latter group, uh, meaning that we're seeing uh, higher rates of of hospitalization, uh, higher rates of ICU admission, higher rates of death in the African American community. Um, for reasons that we don't entirely understand, um, uh, and 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 that really scared me when I saw that information coming from the Centers for Disease Control. The Centers for Disease Control didn't didn't present it as, as a straightforward way as I would like, because you know the way they did it, they they just called it non-white. I said, "Come on, guys! I mean, are we, are we still there?" Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's where. So so it, it took a while to kind of to get to kind of tease it out and really understand what's going on. But the other thing, and this is one of the reasons I was so excited to have the opportunity to come on, you know, the narrative that's out there, right, is the ones who are getting sick and dying are people over the age of 65. But that's not true in the African-American community. It looks like about a third of the deaths are people under the age of 65. It's, it's, it's 40-year-old moms and dads, 50-year-old moms and dads, early 60-year-old moms and dads, you know, got teenage kids, that sort of thing. That's, those are the ones who are going into the hospital and ICU. And I think that story hasn't gotten out enough that the third of the deaths are in much younger people. And so the, the devastation in the African-American community really bothers me. You know, uh, I think the, the black population in the U.S. represents about 13% of, of the country, but it's much higher in terms of deaths in the, in the black community. So there's, there's something else going on and not just more higher numbers of deaths, but lower age groups as well. And that's, that's really tragic. And, and you see it, I mean, you go, I mean, here in Houston, I've been going on talking to a number of, um, uh, some of the, radio programs that serve the African-American community. Um, and when you, when you start to talk to people, this is, the, this is when it really hit home. Basically, everybody I talk to in the black community here in Houston, also Hispanic community as well, you know, knows, personally knows someone who's gone into the hospital 
or even lost their life from COVID-19. And that's when it hit me that this is, that this is really devastating black and brown communities across the country. Yeah, I think that that's kind of what informed our mission when we first started. We realized that there was no leadership on sort of the national level. And there certainly, therefore, wasn't anyone telling the people in our communities in the hood, as it were, you know, what the stakes are, explaining the virus, explaining the vaccines. Um, and it's so critical that we do that because as we'll continue to discuss, you know, the stakes are higher than they've ever been, you know? That, like, that, that's absolutely right. And and it's not only the, uh, the greater severity of illness, but, you know, people living, uh, especially in low-income neighborhoods, they're getting exposed to the virus a lot more, right? Because if you're living in a low-income neighborhood, chances are you're not making your living via Skype and Zoom, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're out there in, uh, um, you know, either working at construction sites or family-owned businesses, right? You know, you're, you're out and about interacting with people. I think that's, that's a big factor. I think- Or you're living in multi-generational households as well. That's it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, you know, you come home, so let's say you're a 20-year-old kid on a construction site, right? You're coming home, you're not, you're not living in a, you know, in a nice apartment in a, not in a good end of town, right? What, what you are is you're coming home because you're still because you can't afford it because you're still living with your parents and your parents maybe even living with the grandparents and so that's what that multi generational fam family means and so then everybody's getting sick um, because this virus is so contagious so even though the twenty year old may feel fine with COVID nineteen remember he he's still shedding virus from his nose and mouth and and then people are getting sick so I think all of this is snowballing it's the perfect storm of you know, higher mortality, um, lower age of mortality and severe illness, and more exposure just from the nature of living in a low-income neighborhood, that all comes crashing down to explain all those results. Yeah, and, and we'll get into the vaccines uh, at some point in this discussion, but that's why we tend to stress why vaccinations are so important. Um, we try to explain the science behind the vaccines, and help our community understand that despite the history of medical racism and the contemporary inequities, um, we have to persist because we need to trust the science in this instance. Uh, can you briefly discuss the vaccine development and deployment um, in terms of our preparedness uh, with the vaccine field uh, to rapidly develop mRNA vaccines and how that reflects decades of science research on vaccine development and all the learning about SARS that you alluded to earlier. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked that question because, you know, what happened was, you know, when we heard about that Operation Warp Speed program last year, first of all, I hated that name. That was an awful name because, you know, that's the last thing you want to tell people that that somehow these these vaccines are like magic appeared out of nowhere. How, how are you not going to be suspicious of something called Operation Warp Speed? And it's not Operation Warp Speed. What happened is, you know, the pharma CEOs, right? I think they were well-intentioned, but, you know, they sent out these press releases about what they're doing. And, you know, when a CEO of a, of a major company is sending out a press release, he's not writing it for you. He's not writing it for me. He's writing it for his shareholders, right? And, and of course, they're going to spectacularize their accomplishments. And uh, But they were tone deaf to the fact that how people are going to perceive all that. So... It made it sound like these vaccines appeared out of nowhere. They didn't. That I mean, we were in this in this area for at least a decade, and we showed for not for COVID nineteen, but for related coronaviruses like SARS. And we showed, you know, that the spike protein of the virus is kind of the soft underbelly, the the weak link of the virus. How you deliver the spike protein, how all vaccines require you to not only deliver the spike protein, but induce those virus neutralizing antibodies to halt the virus and how, how the best way to do that. That was, that was a decade of research. Um, and if we hadn't done that and others, there is no way the pharma companies would hit the ground running. And I'm saying that not to impress your listeners with, with what we've done, but to tell the story 
that the vaccine program for COVID-19 is a decade-long program. And guess what? That's about the right time frame for a vaccine program. So the reality is the time frame it took to develop COVID-19 vaccines is really not much different from any other vaccine that you've taken or that you've given to your kids. And not enough people hear that as well. They Again, they somehow are, don't trust the vaccines, appropriately so, because the message that they're hearing is uh, this was like a genie in a bottle. You know, it just, it just, you know, rubbed the bottle and the smoke popped out and then you had the vaccine. It was never that way. Yeah, this is more like Operation Building Blocks than op Operation Warp right. Speed. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. exactly um, right. That's exactly is it, right. You, you, you talked about some of the reasons why people are distrusting of this, uh, you know, the marketing of this. One of the reasons uh, that I want to get into is the indemnifying of pharmaceutical companies. So I want to know from your experience, um, is this an unusual thing to indemnify pharmaceutical companies for vaccines like this? And what benefit does it have for vaccine deployment to to go and go that route? I think you know what what they've learned early on is um, you know the courts. Uh, I'm not a, first of all, I'm not an expert in indemnification or legal aspects of vaccines, <laughs> but, but my understanding is they created these vaccine courts early on to actually help the, the plaintiff because they because proving a vaccine actually causes an adverse effect is extremely difficult. So by creating those vaccine courts, it actually makes it easier for the plaintiff to receive compensation in case there's an injury because if you did it, went through a regular court, it'd be much harder to prove that the vaccine actually caused the injury. And in fact, most of the money that's given out of the vaccine court, um, most people believe that 90% are not actually due to the vaccine. You just couldn't prove it clearly one way, way, one way or another. The number of severe adverse events that actually occurs uh, from any vaccine, including a COVID-19 vaccine, is extremely rare. It's on the order yeah, right. of just one, a few per million. Um, uh, so I have a, I've wrote a book uh, about, not about this particularly, but I wrote a book to counter the assertions that vaccines cause autism. Because I am, in addition to being a vaccine scientist and a pediatrician, I have autism, a daughter, yeah. I, my youngest daughter Rachel has autism and intellectual disabilities, and she she still lives with us and. I wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. And, and one of the chapters in the book is Struck by Lightning. It's called Struck by Lightning. It's because the odds of you getting a severe reaction to a vaccine are the odds of getting struck by life by lightning in a lifetime. And that number came out of the, I saw that from the National Geographic. It's, in case you're wondering, it's one in, in 750,000, which is about the likelihood of getting severely injured from a vaccine. But the courts are, are done so you don't have to go ahead and, and, and exhaustively prove it. They, they will award you compensation um, for at a, at a much lower bar. Mm -hmm. I wanted to quickly, since you kind of touched on it, go through how, um, how vaccines work so that people who might have questions can understand that a little bit better. Um, so the way that we kind of explain it, we talk about the security check and like how when you get infections, your immune system kind of reads the virus ID card and uses that to make matching antibodies and that those antibodies then tag the virus for death by cell assassins, right? So you get the intel, you make the antibodies, there's a setup and the kill, right? Um, and then so with these mRNA vaccines kind of gives your cells a cheat code to just make little pieces of the spike protein so that you can start making those antibodies to fight off infection. And so we just kind of explain to people that, you know, when you get that injection, the muscle cells kind of download that cheat code and throw this huge party on top of the cell so that everybody comes and they kind of like put it in their dossier. They know for next time what to do and can respond much quicker. And um, that's kind of the whole point of a vaccine, right? Um, so yeah, so all, so all of these vaccines, what they do is they work by delivering the spike protein. So, you know, people are wringing their hands, hey, should I get to take the mRNA vaccine from Moderna or Pfizer? Should I take the J&J &J adenovirus vaccine? What about these protein particle vaccines that are coming down the line? Should I wait? 
Is one better than the other? What I say is, look, don't wait. This this virus is accelerating uh, and will be uh, as we move into the summer. They all work by the same way. They all work by delivering the spike protein of the virus. That's work that we showed over the last decade. And they induce those virus neutralizing antibodies. And by waiting and trying to cherry pick, you know, overthink it, which one should I take? You actually put yourself at increased risk because, and here's why. Um, the number of cases you're hearing is starting to go down, but now the one of the variants of the of the COVID-19 virus, which goes by that very memorable name of B117. How could you not remember that, mm -hmm. right? So it's a the UK out. the UK variant for everyone the, else the, too. The, the, exactly. So the UK variant that's accelerating, especially in the southern part of the United States. So in um, in Florida, Texas, Georgia. You know, the CDC contract, contracted with this organization called Helix that does all the genomic virus sequencing. Up to 50% of the isolates are that B117 variant. And the reason you need to care about that is what studies they showed in the UK where this variant emerged is about 60% more transmissible than, uh, than anything we're used to. And now, unfortunately, a number of articles coming out, higher hospitalization rates and higher death rates. So it was just published in Nature Magazine today, in fact, higher mm -hmm. death rates. So, um, so I'm really that, and and we knew that was coming. And, and they're so, saying also potentially more pathogenic in children and adolescents. Like I think the Lancet maybe published that a couple of days ago. Um, and so that's kind of one of the other concerns that we've all this time we've been saying the kids are okay. You know, like put them back in right. school. Like they don't so get the sick. So the bottom line is we've got to vaccinate ahead of the variant. And, you know, the Biden administration, what they did was they put forward a pretty good plan. So they, you know, they, when they came into office in January, they said, look, we're going to fully vaccinate uh, the American people by the fall or maybe by the end of the year. And everybody agreed that was a good plan. I agreed it was a good plan. But then, you know, John Lennon says, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And, um, and, <laughs> and, and life happened and and well and people might use the uh, another word than life but something happened and, and that is the, the uk variant and all of a sudden we realized that we have to get ahead of this and vaccinate not by the fall or end of the year but by the end of the spring if we're going to save lives and so i was out there saying this and the biden administration listened they listened to the scientists so they've put in place a plan to one, procure more vaccines now, and second, to open up vaccination sites. And the other thing they did to their credit was, you know, they realized that if you want to get a vaccine, you know, the whole the whole Operation Warp Speed approach, giving it to the states was to use the pharmacy chains uh, and, and the hospital systems. But guess what? Some of the low income neighborhoods are pharmacy deserts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have a- And a rural medicine, neighborhoods right? too. What's that? In the rural areas as well. Rural areas as well. You know, there's not a CVS and a Rite Aid and around every corner in a low income neighborhood. So that wasn't going to work. So the Biden administration really stepped up, I thought, and put together a pretty good plan of expanding uh, vaccination sites and creating centers to vaccinate people in some of the low income neighborhoods, a lot of black and brown neighborhoods. Um, it's still not perfect. Um, but it's at least now we've got something in place to, to accelerate at two levels. One, have more vaccine available, two, make more sites available. Um, um, what about from a surveillance perspective, right? Are, are we being vigilant enough in our variant testing? The, uh, the centers, the center, you were, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and, <laughs> And we only found this out later. And I just, you know, because U.S. is the most genomic, greatest genomic sequencing capacity in the world. And maybe China, maybe China rivals us. But, you know, we invented uh, many aspects of genomic sequencing. We were the first to do the human genome, right? You would mm -hmm. think, right, we'd be totally on top of this. And, um, and we weren't, we were ranked near the bottom of uh, genomes being sequenced. And, you know, it's just another example of how our COVID response last year came up small. And uh, so a lot of these variants came into the country without us even being aware of it. I mean, this happened before, you know, the whole entry of the virus while we were busy, you know, uh, uh, 
making travel restrictions from China last year at this time, the virus had already entered New York City from Europe by the end of January, beginning of February, and nobody knew it till the first case got diagnosed in March. So we missed that whole month of opportunity to control it. Well, the same is true with the genomic sequencing. So now we're slowly getting up to speed, still not adequate, but we know enough now to know the B117 variant is, is here in a big way and I'm extremely worried about it. So are we. Um, to that end, I guess, you know, one of the biggest worries we've been telling some of our listeners about escape mutants and why that and what they are and why it makes um, vaccination so much more important because of um, these sort of cat and mouse games we have, we're have we going to have to play. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that's going to look like on our end, you know, if we get to the point where we don't really get everyone vaccinated in time for some of these mutations, does that mean booster shots? Like, what does that mean, practically speaking? Well, first of all, the good news is all of the Operation Warp Speed vaccines that are being released to the public in the United States, they work equally well against the original variant and this UK variant. So that's really important information. But they don't work as well against two of the variants that are starting to pop up, the South Af- one from South yeah. Africa and the one from uh, Brazil. Mm-hmm. So the South Africa is the B1351, the Brazil is the P1. Most of the virus genomics people that I've been speaking to seem to think that the B117 from the UK, that's going to be the dominant one. So that if the one from Brazil or South Africa comes up, it won't be till later on. So it buys us some time. But don't forget, don't don't be surprised if we wind up needing another boost. So that if you got that two-dose Moderna Pfizer vaccine, uh, mRNA vaccine, don't be surprised if later on this year, early next year, you're going to need to get a third immunization. And same with that J&J one-dose vaccine that everyone's talking about. It may be a two-dose vaccine to get ahead of those other variants. I don't think we have to worry about it so much for now, but it's something to keep in mind. In the meantime, we want to stop any new variants from emerging, and that's another reason to get ahead of it. We... uh we often tend to think of health and issues in a very insular nationalistic sense. Um, But this is not just a U.S. pandemic and it's not just a European pandemic. And it's certainly not just a Western pandemic. This is a global pandemic. So can you talk a little bit, you you kind of etched into that. Can you talk a little bit about the global concerns for not getting vaccinations Uh, to other areas that don't have the same access as most places in the United States. Absolutely. You know, we're, um, uh, the U.S. is uh, probably near the top. I think Israel is at the very top, uh, but following that's U.K. in the U.S. in terms of vaccinating our populations. And, you know, everyone's being very self-congratulatory saying, hey, you know, uh, we're, we're taking care of ourselves, but I'm really worried about what's happening in the rest of the world. Most of Latin America is nothing um, in terms of vaccines and being able to vaccinate their population. And Africa is looking pretty bleak right now. And even though Africa has done fairly well um, in 2020 with this South African variant now accelerating up from South Africa into Malawi and Mozambique and uh, in Tanzania, I worry that's going to be really catastrophic. So one of the things we're trying to do is in our lab, we have developed a low cost recombinant protein vaccine. I don't know if we'll get it into the U.S., but at least now we're scaling up production in India that can help provide uh, for Africa. But, you know, this is another lesson learned that, you know, we're too dependent on the multinational pharmaceutical companies and not enough local capacity. So, for instance, there are no new vaccines made on the African continent, if you can believe that. So, you know... Right, and weren't they trying to, like, block patent access as well so that some countries couldn't? Well, well, the problem is, you know, those two mRNA vaccines that we have here, it's still a new technology and we don't mm-hmm. have, that. that's still a new technology and it's still hard to scale up. Remember, let's, let's talk about Sub-Saharan Africa. 1.1 billion people live in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? If you need two doses, 
you're talking over 2 billion, you know, we're talking about 2 billion doses of vaccine. Where's that going to come from? Those two mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, it's a new technology. We're not going to be able to make nearly enough um, of that mRNA vaccine. And plus it's got that very difficult freezer chain yep. requirement. So mm -hmm. how do you, you know, how do you bring freezers into, you know, places like DR Congo? You ever look at a map of DR Congo and compare it to the size of the United States? It's about half the size of the Eastern United, it's about the size of the Eastern United States. And they probably have about 20 roads. I mean, it's so getting the vaccine out is really challenging, especially if you have a freezer chain requirement. So what do you do? Um, and so I actually have an op-ed piece I wrote for the LA Times that came out Sunday that said, we've got to build vaccine development capacity in Africa, not only for these pandemic threats, but you know, there are a lot of diseases that only occur in Africa and the pharma companies aren't gonna make those vaccines because there's no financial incentive. So we're trying to work out ways for doing that. Same with Latin America, same with you know some of the poor countries in, in Southeast Asia, we need, we need a different business model. In the meantime, we're accelerating our low cost recombinant protein vaccine. We call it the people's vaccine because we think we could do it for $1.50 a dose. Um, yeah. which is about as inexpensive as, you, as wow. you can get. And so that's being scaled for production now by Biological E. They're one of the big vaccine producers in India. And then hopefully we can, uh, uh, hopefully that'll make a difference. And the Biden administration just announced they're not going to give the money to us, but they're going to give the money to Biological E to help them with, with production. So that's, that's pretty exciting news. So that's hopefully so that'll make a difference. But I am really worried we... We, in, you know, everybody was so focused on the innovation, right? And uh, uh, and that's fine, but nobody gave enough thought to what do, what do you do to some of these low and middle income countries in places like Africa and Latin America, poor areas of Southeast Asia, you know, what they need is simple, non-fussy, durable vaccines that you could give to large populations quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, th this next part is kind of a, a two-part question, but you know, before we end, we I, I would like for you to discuss your latest book, "Preventing the Next Pandemic: Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science." Um, how do we stay ahead of the game if we're seeing a deterioration in the communal communal fight against disease spread? So, what do we have to do to turn this around? That's the first part, and the second part is, you know, I would love if you could touch on some of the hesitancy issues. Um, that that we're grappling with, and how uh, how that affects the overall potential of herd immunity, and what we need for that. Yeah, absolutely. So the the book um, a, here here it is. Uh, it's preventing the next pandemic: vaccine diplomacy in a time of anti science. It's published by Johns Hopkins Press. Um, I like writing books. That's one of the new things I'd learned. I moved to Texas 10 years ago with my two youngest kids and uh, my wife and two youngest kids. And I always wanted to be a writer. So I, this is my fourth book now. And I haven't made much, it's not a day job, but I, but I do love, I do love uh, writing. Um, it makes the observation that, you know, when everyone talks about COVID-19, they make it sound like it's this extraordinary event. It wasn't, I mean, but there's, COVID-19 is more like a culminating event that follows on declines over the last five or six years. But it's happening because of these big social forces like war and political collapse, urbanization. And so I ident identify a bunch of hotspot areas of the world. So for instance, the Arabian Peninsula because of the Syrian conflict and the civil war there and the ISIS occupation and the war in Yemen, that proxy war between Saudi Arabia in Iran, that collapsed health systems and really drove up disease or what's going on in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, like in the Boko Haram areas of Ni Northern Nigeria, where you've got all this armed banditry on civilian populations and all of this, all these atrocities. That's also stopped vaccination programs and vector control programs or in Venezuela with the Maduro regime and they've, you know, the socioeconomic collapse there bringing back measles and identify about five or six areas. Uh, and so it's kind of a wake up call that we should recognize them. And as physicians and public health experts, you know, I don't know about your, your training, but my training, you know, in medical school and graduate school, I never heard about war and political collapse and 
poverty and 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 urbanization but it says that we have to recognize that these are some of the big drivers of disease and then the last one was is is anti-science meaning this rise in uh, dedicated groups that are targeting specific uh, other groups to convince them that vaccines cause autism and terrible things. And unfortunately, it's really active here in the United States. So back in 2017, the anti-vaccine, uh, I call them ringleaders, I, they really are very diabolical. They targeted the Somali immigrant community in, in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. They came, this was reported by the Washington Post, they came in town hall meetings, they held, convinced them that vaccines cause autism. They dropped vaccination coverage from 90% to 40%, caused a measles epidemic that landed uh, dozens of kids in the hospital. Then they did it again with the Orthodox Jewish community in 2018, 2019. They uh, convinced them that vaccines cause autism and they did really inflammatory stuff. They started parading around with yellow Jewish stars, you know, because in, in the Holocaust, you know, if you lived in the ghetto in Poland, you were forced to identify yourself wearing a, a yellow Jewish star. They wrote the word vax in it, V-A-X, to make it look like Hebrew letters. I mean, I mean, wow. it's about as, about as offensive as you can get, right? That's what they did. And now, then in 2019, I noticed they started targeting the African-American communities. They staged these Harlem vaccine forums that did a lot of damage. They even had one in the in the Riverside Church on the Upper West Side of New York, which you know is one of the iconic churches in the history of the Civil Rights Movement. You know the Reverend Sloan Coffin, and so this really worries me. And now I've I've seen a trailer for it. They're they're making a movie, a documentary, and in the trailer it looks like they're going to compare vaccines to Tuskegee experimentation. Uh, which is about as exploitative as you can get. And uh, and I'm saying no. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm coming on all these these shows to say we've got to stop this. I mean, vac a vaccine is the only guarantee that you're going to have to stay out of the hospital and the ICU and by targeting the African-American community, you know, comparing vaccines to Tuskegee, that that's not going to go well. And, and I'm very concerned about that. Now, of course, you know, you've got, the legacy of Tuskegee, and I understand the historic uh, distrust and and the historic racism, but this piling, this new piling on, uh, I'm really worried about. Yeah. Yeah. So are we? Um, I think we were we were hoping that that you would leave us with your um, your parting thoughts to the black and brown communities in that regard, but I think you just. <laughs> well, no. well, you know, I, I don't want. I don't want to end on too dour. And no, I mean, it, I mean, it. The, I think we're going to do pretty well. I think you know by later in the summer, um, we could vaccinate our way out of this epidemic in the United States if enough people get vaccinated and if the vaccines perform as they have so far, not only halting you from going to the hospital but interrupting transmission. But the part I worry about is what happens between now and then. And so this is crunch time, you know, from the middle of March and going into April, May, where we don't have the full mother load of vaccines coming in and not enough people are getting vaccinated quickly enough and the variant is here. And so, you know, what I don't, what I want to avoid, I, I want to keep as many people alive between now and when those, the full shipment of vaccines come in in the summer because we're going to have a good life ahead of us. This is not the time now to, you know, to lose your life or the life of a loved mm -hmm. one. And, and that's, to me, is the urgency right now. One last question, sorry, that you made me think of, but um, I guess talking about the plans that the Biden administration has in place, there's been a lot of chatter recently about um, trying to optimize this crunch time and to, you know, combat all this emergence of variants by uh, switching to a one dose strategy so that more people mm -hmm. can get the first dose. Could, could you just briefly give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, and there's, and there's not consensus in the scientific community yeah. about this. So, so and, and I, I have an opinion, but I also recognize the merits of the other. So the, the ones kind of leading the charge on not necessarily going to single dose, but delaying the right, second right. dose so you can get more single dose mm -hmm. out. So, 
my friend and colleague Mike Osterholm was a real thought leader in this, and um, uh, others as well. Zeke Emanuel have been pushing pushing hard for this, and I and I understand it because you want to get more people vaccinated, uh, and and even if it's only partially protective after a single dose, it'll still help. But what the thing I worry about is looking at the data coming out of Israel. Um, the two doses of vaccine, I think, gives a with the two mRNA vaccines clearly gives you, you know, up to 95% protection versus 40 to 60%. Now they only looked at it after a few weeks after that single dose and Mike's and others opinion is no, the numbers will go up if you let it go longer. Uh, but um, so Tony Fauci has been you know, pushing hard on the, on, you know, sticking to the two doses within that time frame. I've suggested maybe as a compromise, you can delay it a week or two. The FDA will let it go up to, as, as, as released it, going up to 42 days. But that's what we're kind of looking at. You know, how to, if we have to ration vaccines, what's, what's the best way to do it? And I understand maybe a small delay, but I wouldn't want to let it go too much longer. Uh, Dr. Holtes, we can't thank you enough uh, for joining us today. Um, you know, everything you've offered our audience is going to save lives, and that's what it really comes down to. Um, we want to thank you for, for being here with us. We want to thank everybody for tuning in to our Hood Med chat discussion. Uh, let everybody know that uh, at Hood Medicine, we want to bring you trusted individuals. Uh, to provide you with the facts and information to allow you to make decisions necessary to keep you and your family safe and in turn your community safe as well. Um, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to support our effort, donate to our cause, or find out about our next events. Uh, you can visit hoodmedicine.org or at hood underscore medicine on Instagram and Twitter or hood medicine initiative, all one word on Facebook. Thank you again, Dr. Hotez. Thank you. And to Dr. Hotez, um, why don't you well, tell it? Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you also online? Oh yeah, um, you can just uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Peter Hotez, and that's probably the the, <laughs> the, the, the easiest, most straightforward way. But that's let funny. me let me just thank you guys for for doing this because this talk about saving lives this is what you got you guys are doing god's work here doing this and, and getting this word out because we just don't have enough opportunities like this and um, I, i'm very appreciative of having the opportunity to come on and happy to come back because you know this these Jeez. goalposts, these goalposts keep moving right i mean this yeah. is a new virus pathogen <laughs> You know, if you if we had this conversation three four months ago, you know, I would have said, you know, we got clear sailing. You know, we didn't even know about these variants very much. So, so this thing does change. So I appreciate the opportunity. We will definitely Thank have you, you back. You. <laughs> we would love Absolutely. to. Thank you guys, everyone, for um, joining us, and um, be safe. Get vaccinated. Save the hood. <laughs>